that one you want to see. That's, you know, that's what, you know, they will live in and all that. But, you know, yeah. this army, nobody really, like, spoke, spoke much of them, especially after David defeated Goliath. You just hear about, you know, Israel just kind of, like, pushing them back and pushing them back. It's kind of like, you know, like, like big hype until, you know, like, their, their star player went down mm -hmm. just yeah. twice. Okay, so the next one is, would you rather live through a famine or live through the 10 plagues? <laughs> Why? Taking our ambassador of the islands, so if y'all can reach into y'all little pink bag or not, and get y'all little pamphlet, which is called the Rhapsody, right? So, in your Rhapsody, turn to the, if y'all can please turn to today's date, April 26th, please. Perfect without fear. Is everyone there? Uh, I'm gonna say yes. Okay. So for our title gonna be if y'all so I didn't know personally. Our rhapsody is uh, which is eight thousand one hundred and twenty-three word languages. Okay. 
8,123 languages, right? So, opening verse. It's going to be, in his name through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yet the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And the first verse, the first paragraph says, I want you to notice the expression perfect soundness in our opening verse. It's rendered from the Greek word holotharia, which means a perfect state of health, a condition of health with no problems whatsoever. This is God's desire for you, and it's one of the many blessings of living in and by the name of Next is going to read James 1 4 expresses a similar thought. It talks about being perfect and entire, wanting nothing. The term translated entire is holo. I went back a little dictionary. It's called, it's like holochro, holochro, something like that, right? Then it says the verb form of holochoria. It implies being perfectly sound, complete, without blemish. What a life. Mm. What a life indeed. Following God, it says, then to make this happen, God gave us the Holy Spirit, the spirit of life, to keep us perfectly sound. Romans 8 verse 11 says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, real quickly before we move on, I just wanted to... Um, that, that Romans is, should be KJV, correct? Or if I'm... Yeah, so I just wanted to re, uh, revisit it in NLT, right? It says, the Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. So, when he says, or just a quick, uh, Tidbit. When he says give life to your mortal bodies, right? Before and before like myself, let me use an example. Before I gave my life to Christ, I was dead. You may not I may not look dead, right? But I was dead. And my, my spirit was dead. You know what I'm saying? But once I turned 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 over, declared with my mouth and believed in Christ and gave my life fully to Christ. I was alive, you know what I'm saying? You know, I was, like my, my flesh was dead, still is, you know what I'm saying? But it is your spirit which is alive, you know what I'm saying? And that is through the Holy Spirit which gives you life. Yeah, and you know, I'm just, uh, you know, this is such a important verse to me because I'll never forget what the Rhapsody Club 2019, I want to say, 2019, it was actually Pastor Rachel and I were taking it um, the next day, and I remember, spent about like 10 minutes just meditating on Romans 8, 11. And you know, meditation is so powerful. You know, if you've never meditated on a scripture before, even if it's just, even if it's just one verse, you can go back home and take like, even if it's just five minutes, you know, to mutter, you know, you know of course you go from muttering, you know, you can just warning it. Because truly, I think from that night on forward, it was like the, the reality of, you know, Romans 8, 11, you know, just, it, it, it shone so brightly in my spirit. You know, the like, you know, like he, he really was raised from the dead because it's the kind of thing that like you hear, like, yeah, you know, oh, it was Jesus, you know, he died, he rose again, cool. But like, you don't really like see how deep that is, you know, until you go to a funeral, you know, why somebody, you know, died, but they're definitely not raising again, you know. Of course, you know, until the, you know, first flight, you know, trumpet and everything. But it's, it's, it's like, you know, like when you actually understand, you know, that, thing that allowed the human body to die, then resurrect, dwells in you, and you kind of parlor that out old because, you know, it's like, of course, now, you know, you know that death is not an option, but there's that potential power because that power has the potential to bring back a life from the dead. 
So since you don't need to be brought back from the dead now, it means that that power is still there to do something else in you. You just have to put it to work like that. You know, and that, I mean, Romans 8 verse 11, that scripture for real. In the previous verse, verse 10, it says, but if Christ is in you, then even through your body is subject to death because of sin. The spirit gives life because of righteousness. Because of righteousness. Romans 8.10, NIV translation. Christ in you, the Holy Spirit is in you. Guarantees the perfect soundness of spirit, soul, and body. It brings to mind Peter's encounter with Amos, who had been crippled for eight years. All Peter said to him was, Amos, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. Acts chapter 9, verse 34. Aeneas was restored to a perfect state of health because Peter understood the transcendent power of the name of Jesus and Christ living in us. As a Christian, Christ lives in you, and you live in him. Your faith is in his name, and consciousness of his indwelling presence will keep you in perfect soundness. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So, I mean, before we get into prayer, I just want to give an opportunity you know, for somebody you know, to share something that they have done with this rhapsody. You know, because um, this is a, this, this, this is such a powerful rhapsody. And, you know, I know, like, the time that the got to is short, but there's, there's so much that's dwelling in, inside of this, even just in this last um, paragraph alone. Both of y'all's examples kind of bring to light or brings to mind the understanding of like how, like what your consciousness, I think this last paragraph, right, what your consciousness should be if you actually believe what you say you believe, right? Because when you understand um, what he did and what, I think who is it that was saying like, if that spirit, if that power is able to raise Jesus from the dead, then how much more like you that's not, you know what I mean? Like, bro, do even deep how wild that is that same energy, that same level of power still lives inside of you. I, but through the study of the word and through the consciousness, I feel like you come into actually understanding just how big this is and just how much you should reject <laughs> defects, you know, and, and sickness. So, please God. All right, thank you very much, Pastor Nicole. So, I mean, now, you know, we're going to get into the prayer. So, you know, In three, two, one. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for making me perfect and entire, wanting nothing, unrighteous, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in your sight, to the glory and praise of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, that's been the rest of me. It's the Bible edition. So, you know, well, again, I'm going to pick a few people, and you're going to come up, and you're going to close your eyes, and, you know, we're going to have the name of the character for everybody else to see, and they're going to try and guide you to who the character is, right? So you're going to have about a minute to go through as many characters as possible. You get it? So if I'm here, you know, my eyes are closed, and let's say, you know, that the character is, um, you know, David, um, you know, you can say, you know, Solomon's father, you know, Mary Bathsheba, you know, wrote the book of Psalms, and like, you know, things of the sort, to help me guess who it is, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, everybody's helping, you know, so trying to help the person whose eyes are closed guess who the Bible character is. You get it? All right. So, first person, let's go you with the, the plaid shirt. Okay. 
Shout out Shedra, if you got two points, you got two points. All right, so we'll cap it. So that's two. Yeah. 
Do we, do we got one more? Oh, that's Elizabeth. Elizabeth's husband, his wife. Huh? You like Yeah. Congratulations, Linear. You know, uh, you got four characters. Thank you to everybody who came out and participated. And, you know, thank you to our audience, you know, who started off, you know, a big, you know. Actually, shout out to Stephanie. Shout yes. out to uh, I had two voices. Nobody was talking. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, you know. See, 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 you know, that's what I'm saying, because I knew you knew, and that's why I defended okay. you when you came up first, because I'm, okay. I'm like, I know she knows. Okay, thank you. Gotta, thank you. All right, bro. Enjoying themselves so far. Yeah. Right today, we're going to be playing Pick It Up and Preach. So on today's segment of Pick It Up and Preach, I'm going to have three people come up to the front, and we go. We have the items here for you to pick it up and preach about it. We have the items here for you to pick it up and preach about any volunteers. Well, I'm going to pick somebody. <laughs> yeah. Any volunteers? Going once, going twice, going three wonderful times. Um, our first person I'm gonna pick is um, hmm. let me go, Thomas and Tommy. Everybody clap it up for Tommy. That's our first person. Okay, second person, second person we're going to have coming up. 
is going to be Brother Chico. Clap it up for Brother Chico. Clap it up for Brother Chico. And the last person. Let's give a big round of applause for Christine. So listen up. Here are the rules. Lower down for me, please. Here are the rules. So each person has about 45 seconds. 45 seconds on the clock. We have we have an item for each of y'all, right? And it's up to the audience to decide who has the best segment. So each person is gonna go up first. Some, I mean, it's gonna go in order from Christine, Chico, and Tommy. So, Christine, come to the floor. You have you have 15 seconds to to think about it. You have 15 seconds. The first item. The first item is a phone charger, so you got 15 seconds. up in the spirit yeah. we need to pray just like how our phone dies when we don't spend time with God our soul also dies okay so when your phone is about to die you charge it in you get plugged in so you need to read your Bible you need to spend time with Jesus and and Fellowship, go to church. Um, praise God. Because you know why? Because Christ is our firm foundation. And with this right here, you know, 
God is able to tell us that he is firm, he is standing right. This right here is telling us that no matter what circumstances, what no matter the challenges that we come your way, God is always still going to be there because he's he's firm, he has locked it, he's dealt with it, you know, like and you know like God has like he's answered your prayers, he said, and so, so, so shall it be, you know, like so shall it be. So he's telling you that like, you know, it's locked, it's sealed, like it has been done. Like you don't even have to worry about it because you know why? Because you cast off your cares and worry on to him. You know? Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Tommy. Can I have y'all three lined up in front of me, facing, facing the back wall? Just line up this way, face that way. So we gonna we gonna do it by um, cheer the loudest for the person who you think won be the best segment. So first up, we have Christine. Clap it up for Christine. Let's go. Okay, okay. Next we have Brother Chico. Okay, okay. I'm the same kind of same. Last we have Tommy. Yeah. So I think that's a hard one. I think that's a hard one. We all think one. So let me do it one more time. I think I think I'm confused. Christine? Okay, okay, okay. Brother Chico? Last but not least Tommy. Shout out to Tommy. Everybody clap it up for the winner, Tommy. Unless you're taking summer classes. <laughs> Praise God. All right, real quick, we're going to go into pretty much the reason we all came. Um, the title of today's event is Let's Talk About It. Now, some of y'all might ask you, especially those of you on this end. So, we're going to take a few questions. I'm going to welcome up my co-hosts on today is, can we do, are we recording this? We can actually put this on my Spotify as a podcast session. Yes? <laughs> Praise God. All right. So, I want to quickly welcome, can we have the chairs, please? Thank you. My esteemed panelists. First off, I want to quickly welcome all the way from, how do you introduce this? All the way from, dang, Houston, Texas, really. <laughs> but we have to do some group C. Woo! The highest is Esther. Yes, yes, keep going, keep going. How can I, wait, where is it? How can you be content 
in singleness, but you really desire to be in a relationship. What do y'all think? Audience? First of all, let me ask, how many of y'all are single? Everybody. How many of y'all are like, how many of y'all are taken? I don't know, that's right. <laughs> okay, so everyone, everyone here is single. Are y'all in situationships or are y'all actually single? Because I feel like there's no way. <laughs> Sir, what'd you say? I already know you're in a relationship. Matter of fact, I saw you yesterday. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. All right, so who wants to answer? All right, the people that are married. Are single. Single. How are you taking care right now? How are, how are you? How are you? <laughs> All right, is there anyone here that relates with this question where you feel like, oh, would anyone be bold enough to turn to him? Yeah, were you going to say something or are you just answering the question? Go ahead. Um, I would say to be content in your singleness is like knowing you are in Christ first mm -hmm. before entering your relationship. Like, like, focus on like your love of God first because his love, like, like above anyone else's love, and then you'll be able to, like, you'll be able to bring someone like that. Gotcha. Loves you as, like, close enough to have God with you. Clap it up, clap it up. All right. Okay. What's your name? Nikoi. Nikoi? Um, I would say work on yourself. Like, don't be worried about someone else's love when you use your love first. Mm -hmm. Work on yourself. Work on your mental, your physical, the things around you. Work on yourself. Um, yes, I'm doing this. Thank you so much. Um, when I heard the question, like, be content with your singleness, when I, when I think about the word content, it needs to be satisfied, right? So to be satisfied with the fact that you're single, I think um, one way that can really help is you have to know who you are in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. And first of all, you have to accept the love of God before you can accept the love of others. Because if you can't love God, you can't love others, right? Because God, God, God is love, right? So you have to understand, first and foremost, you have to even love yourself. You have to know who you are. Right, not only know who you are, but love the fact that you are who you are is the way you are, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you acknowledge that fact, you acknowledge that identity, you can now be, you know, who you are. Because somebody, because like I used to say, there's a saying I say where it says, um, if you don't know who you are, somebody will tell you who you're not, mm -hmm. right? So it's always wise to you know keep that identity, you know, you know, acknowledgeable. So you know when the time comes and you're ready, you're able to stand your ground and you know, okay, that person I need to know what's right and what's wrong. So that's not the way I think about it. Sure, I love it. You know, for this question, I will just say this thing. I have I have an issue with the word like singleness. Because like, you know, usually like my single season, I'm really like, weren't you born single? Like, there's not a season, it's just you. That's how I feel. I feel like there's no such thing as a single season personally. I feel like you're either you or you're me. And that's that. You know, so when it talks about contentment, not gonna lie. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, you know, you, you know, you just, <laughs> you need a little, um, just like you need a little cuddle, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm not kidding, but you know, like, so when I talk about contentment, I feel like, for me at least, understanding, like, I think what everyone has said, like, who you are, because I think a lot of times what people, what people conflate or confuse as um, discontentment is really just, like, confusion. It's really just you're not sure or like you either are seeking for something outside of yourself that literally can only be found in Christ. So if you're lonely when you don't have, you know, a man or a girl, chances are you might not like marriage or your relationship might not be all that you think it actually will be because you don't have that, you know. And sometimes people end up being like super clingy when they do get into a relationship because you're putting all your like requirements and your dependency. This person's supposed to be your your best friend and your brother and your, I'm like, bro, like, relax. So I feel like part of it is also like, number one, understanding who you are, like having that contentment um, and just like, I'm not in a single season, this is just who I am. Learn hobbies, I'm gonna give you practical things. Like find hobbies, you'll be too busy, I promise you. Find things that you actually enjoy, make friends, spend time with the Lord. When you have that intimacy with the Lord, it'll be even hard for you to settle for I'm not even alive. You'll be very content because after you see, no offense, but sometimes after you see what's out there, <laughs> you, yeah, huh? He's got. Did you have any questions? Um, the question says like, 
you know, how are you, how do you stay content while being single? Single. My question is, what makes you think you'll be content when you're married? Right. The Bible tells us in First Corinthians 7 that married people have a lot of problems. And so it goes back to what everyone said. <laughs> she said, but they want the problem. Well, the problem. I don't think you want the problem. You wish it was single. Um, I, I'll just read it. It says, 1 Corinthians 7, 28, it says, But if you do marry, and you have not sinned, and if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. So even Paul, in the Bible, was telling people not to get married, to be honest, because he knew that there, with it comes a lot of challenges. Um, and it goes back to being content. Like, if you're not content now, you will never be content. And that's, the, and that's the truth of the matter. And so just like work on being yourself, work on being content right now. Because when you get married, um, we feel like your partner's gonna like, you know, change you or cause you to be better. And that may not always be the case, right? You should already be full and then have excess that you can give to somebody else. So that should be your goal, not that I'm empty or I'm half full and if I have this person, they're gonna, you know, fill me up, make me happy, because that's not always the case, so. All right, moving on. I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm surprised. All right, does anyone want to pick the question or should I keep picking? Ooh. No, we can do it. I like it. All right, this question says, why does God let his people struggle? Mm. Maybe we should rephrase the question, does God let his people struggle? No. <laughs> I mean, maybe, I mean, like, what's the backing? Are you going to say the thing? Um, I was gonna say, I don't think life would be as fruitful if you always had something. to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, so why do people, why, why does God let people struggle? First, we need to establish that there are several causes of struggles in the life, lives of people. Let me put it that way. Um, number one, struggle can come as a result of your ignorance. Ignorance of God's word, right? You do not know or you do not understand what God has freely given to you. You don't know how to appropriate the blessings of God in your life, right? Maybe you fall sick because sometimes, I mean, many times people attribute all challenges, all problems to God. When things are not going right, it is God. When things are somehow, somehow, God is the one who is made that happen. Right, exactly. So it's, it's not God. Let me first establish that fact. If there's anyone who is trying to bring a solution to your life, it is God. And he already did that in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Praise God. So struggles come as a result of, number one, ignorance of God's word. You don't know enough yet. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is go into the word of God, study the word of God, eat the word of God, listen to messages, faith-filled messages. One by a man of God is, you know, always a go-to, a, a go-to, of course, yeah. So go to the message of a man of God, listen to the message, increase your faith, glory to God. So that way you know how to approach the situation and bring about a solution. And then another source of struggle could be foolishness, foolish decisions. A choice to close your Bible is a choice that is a foolish choice, let me put it that way. Because if you do not study the word of God, then you're not going to the source. You're not going to the answer. You're not going to the solution. So that's foolishness. That's one example of foolish decision. And then when it comes to, okay, maybe, let's say maybe God allows some things to happen in your life, like Romans chapter 5 talks about, right? that um, tribulation produces. Let me actually read that scripture real quick. Yeah, Romans chapter five. Praise God. All right, so it says, 
Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. So he talked about the fact that, yes, we glory in what Christ has accomplished for us, in the victories that come as a result of his death and resurrection. However, we do not only glory in this, we glory also in tribulations. Why? Because tribulation produces perseverance, right? So if I never go through that challenge, because sometimes you pray, oh, I really want to be a patient person. But you need to go through a situation that will actually bring out that patience in you because the patience already is in you. The Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit, one of which is patience. So you are not trying to be patient. You were born a patient person. But being in the right situation will bring out the fruit of patience in you. Glory to God. So it says that what tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character. That's stability. So come what may. You have this assurance. If another challenge come, I know I'm going to come out of it. It's a walkover for me. This is bread for me. Why? Because you've gone through it once. You realize the faithfulness of God. It produced something in you, a character, a stability, a standing firm. Glory to God. So it says perseverance produces character. And that's something that God looks forward to seeing in you. God wants you to be a stable person. Not someone every time you come in contact with a challenge, you, you quake. You are afraid. You know, he wants you to be stable. He wants you to be like someone that says, oh, the same God that parted the Red Sea is going to bring water out of the rock. The same God that brought water out, uh, water out of the rock is going to rain manna from heaven. All the children of Israel, every time they came in contact with a challenge, they complained. Right? They complained. They murmured against God. And that's not the children that God is breeding. Glory to God. God is raising a supreme um, stock. And that's you and I. So perseverance produces character. And the last thing that character does, character produces hope. And hope is that assurance. Hope is a confident assurance. It's not, oh, I hope it will be. No, it's a confident assurance that I know that I'm going to be above in every situation, regardless of what it may look like right now. Glory to God. So yeah, these are some things I wanted to add. I have overcome the world, but if you read in Amplified, it says, Amplified says, I have told you these things, so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you'll have tribulation, trials, distress, frustrations, but be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, be certain, undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it from the power to harm you and have conquered it for you. And so the question was talking about how, why does God let his people struggle? So it was seeming like God was letting his own struggle, and that's not the case. The Bible says, this is Jesus talking, so this is not just um, scripture. This is Jesus saying it himself, that he has overcome the world and its ability to harm you. So that's not a God that wants anything bad for you. And back to what uh, Sister Esther was talking about, knowledge. Most times, people struggle for knowledge, that, and that's the, that's the, the point. Um, we read in Galatians 4, verse 1. It says, now what? I mean is, now what I mean is that as long as the inheritor or the heir is a child under age, he does not differ from a slave, although he is the master of all the estate. So you can be a child of God, but if you do not know, if you're, if you're not grown in knowledge of the word of God, you'll act, you'll live like a slave. You'll live like a, a hobo in the, in the kingdom of God. And so that means you need to know who you are. And so part of the struggle is not knowing who you are. It's allowing, you know, you feel a small pain, not knowing who you are and letting it overpower you. I'm like, no, I, I shouldn't be feeling pain. This is not normal for the child of God. Um, and so I think most of it is that. Thank you, Pastor, for this opportunity. Um, I think 
just to add on to what Sister Esther was saying, I think just knowing the word of God um, is what will, you know, let you and make you understand what's going on in your life in the moment. Um, one thing that you can count on is God's word and his promises, right? The Bible talks about how all things, all things work together for your good um, for those that love God. Um, so you would know that whether through the storm, right, whether through the bad, whether through the good, it will all literally come back around for your good, right? So um, even if as hard as it seems, you know, even through the storm, it may seem as though it may look so terrible, so bad, it may even seem like, man, you know, I don't, you know what I'm saying? But even through that storm, God is literally building your trust in him. So like things are literally through that bad, it's really if you look deeper and you know the word, you'll see that it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to, you know, also add on what he said, um, going to God. I was reminded of a scenario that happened in the Bible of God, winning souls, where they had sent someone, they cast it out and demon from her and that was the source of their livelihood, right? So because of that, they imprisoned them. So someone could be in that situation and be like, God, we're doing this for you. Like, why would you let this happen to us, right? So their attitude could have been that of complaining, murmuring against God, but rather in the prison, while they were in chains, the Bible said they understood something, right? They knew that God, number one, was not the cause of that. The devil definitely was. He wasn't excited that his kingdom was being you know, scattered. So raised an uproar against them. So they knew when, who the opposer was and they directed their praise rather to God. And sometimes you find yourself in a challenging situation, you complain, you murmur. The thing is you remain. When that's your attitude, you go around the mountain another lap. Like children of Israel, what should have taken them 40, 40 days, it took them 40 years to accomplish because of wrong attitude. So in that struggle, in that challenge, they understood that God is for them, not against them. And if there's anyone who wants to bring them out of it, it is God. So what did they do? They praised, they worshiped in that situation. And you know, I heard someone say one time that as you know, they were praising and worshiping, it seemed as though God was enjoying the rhythm and God was stopping to the worship and praise and the top of God became the earthquake, you know, that shook the very foundations of the prison that they were in, and their chains, their prison doors flung open, not only theirs, every other prisoner in there, their doors flung open. So that even gave them a bigger opportunity to see the power of God at work. It seemed like a struggle initially, but that was a platform for them to see the glory of God manifested in their life. I did be, they were not in that situation. So don't see that struggle or that challenge as a limitation or as a problem. See it as an opportunity for God to manifest his glory and his power in your life. I just want to add to that today. Praise God. Yeah. All right, because of time we're gonna move on, but I feel like I wanna, anyway, can't add anymore. So let's take another question. Um, someone asked, oh, it's kind of, it's not sad, it's kind of, ooh. Okay, let's do this one. Um, it says, why do I find it really, I'm gonna connect, come, um, add two questions together. Why do I find it really hard to connect with God? It just truly really feels like he doesn't love me and I am a lost cause. And then another question is kind of similar. It says, mm, not so similar, but I'm gonna add it anyway. It says, I'm not gonna lie, I really try not to get bored in church, but it feels like I can't really connect with God. Even during worship, what do I do if I don't feel anything? What'd you say? Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay, I'll Okay, I'll start. You know, um, this first question especially where it says, um, it feels like you don't put me on a lost cause. I'm gonna just start there. I'm not even gonna answer the question. Because that part is so blatantly a lie that we got nipped in the bud. Truly, is you gotta know that anything contrary to scripture is not a thought. Just because a thought comes to your mind does not mean it's true. Does not mean the thought is even from you or from God, right? There's times the enemy literally plant lies, deception, by, by causing the father of lies. And so when you have any thought that's like this where it says, 
I, it feels like he doesn't love me and I'm a lost cause. I need you to know, first of all, this person that asked the question is here, and that is a lie from the pit of hell. And you, you see, when you, you hear the words of the Lord Jesus, and you know what he says, he says, I will never, so Lord, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. The scripture says, I will never leave nor forsake you. What do you think that is? What do you think that means? You ever meet someone who says, um, who maybe like you, say you spent like 10 years, not 10 years, <laughs> say you spent like a year of your life just like helping, you know, some, some women, no shade if you make music, but some women, you know, they, it's their dating a dude and he's like, SoundCloud, SoundCloud, like, here's my tape, mixtape. They want to make it, they're so sure they're going to be a rapper. And say so you've been holding him down, see, no shade, I say no shade. <laughs> so you've been holding him down for like five years and he still hasn't made it. How would you feel when that dude turns back at you, or the lady, right, and says, oh, I never asked you to do that? And it happens. It happens. I promise you it happens. There's people who have spent their whole life savings trying to support somebody's rap career. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, but it, it's, it's the same thing we do often to the Lord. I never asked you, because if, if there's a sacrifice that has been made, that literally is also a demonstration of love, and you turn around and say, oh, I don't think you love me. Huh? It's, it's exactly the same thing as saying, oh, I never asked you to do that. So it's, it's I don't even want to get too deep into it because of time, because I need to get through a few other questions, but who's going to take this one? We're only going to have one more. Is there one more? Praise the Lord. Just to add to what you said, um, I think I've been there too at some point in my life, and there's something I want to establish that you may not always feel loved, but you have to always know that you are loved. There is a difference between knowing you're loved and feeling loved. There are moments you wake up, it just seems like this whole day is just, you know, started off terrible, you know, and there is nothing to anticipate. But that should not affect the way you know God's love is to you. If you understand what I'm trying to say. The feeling should not override the knowledge of his love. And that's why you need to be in the word of God. Study the word of God. The Bible says that we should not be conformed to the world. You know, sometimes when you think of confirmation to the word, you just think that, oh, maybe smoking, drinking, and things like that. No. Confirmation to the word, th I mean, this word is anti-God, right? So if you conform to the word, that means you are actually not conscious of God's love for you. But when you are in the word of God, that consciousness comes. You are reminded again, he died for me. I mean, th there was a time, you know, very terrible in my life. And the Lord came to me and told me, he said, let's just, let's start somewhere, right? I died for you. There is no greater act of love than someone laying his life down for you. God, and God told me something. He said, this is me that I am life. I am not even another man that is prone to death. This is God that is not prone to death. God can never die. He is life. Life and death, they are two parallel lines that can never meet. You have to understand that, right? So, but God made it possible for him, which is life, to die for you. You really need to understand the spiritual equations that took place in the realm of the spirit in order for that to be a reality. But God went through everything to show you that you are loved and to show you that he loves you. So every day in your classroom, they are not going to remind you of that love. When you go to the restaurant, you're not going to be reminded of that. It's only one source that reminds you of that love, and that's the word of God. So staying away from the word of God is actually staying away from that reminder, right? So please understand and know for a fact that you are loved, but stay in the word so that you can be reminded of that. I wanted to read a scripture and then go into it deep, just to add to what she said. You know, the Bible says in First uh, John verse, John chapter four verse nineteen, it says, "We love him because he loved us first. Sometimes we feel like, oh, you know, love God is like this like natural feeling, like everyone around me loves God. It's like I love him because he loved me first, right? And so it's something that he did first, and because we know he loves us, then we're like, yeah, so I love him back, right?" When you read 16, it says, and we have known and believed the love that God has to us. You have to know and believe. It's something you just have to do. It's not something that's going to come natural. 
A lot of times we're pretending to be not going, oh, I want to feel like praying, or I want to feel, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It won't always be the whole once you're in it. Um, it says, God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So I just want to add that scripture. Right. Praise God. Thank you so much, Pastor. And I think no one really touched on this part, so I'm just going to, before we go into the next question, the part about, like, I try not to get bored in church. It feels like I can't connect with God. Even during worship, what do I do if I don't feel anything? This is twofold, but first and foremost, you got to understand how the spirit works and how the spiritual realm operates. Your feelings are not fact. Your feelings are not truth, right? That's first off. But also, on the other hand, there is an understanding and there is a depth that you can get to when you choose to put away distraction. Uh, when someone says, I get bored in church, to be honest, you can program yourself. A lot of people don't realize you can program your mind. I guarantee you, some of the things that we watch or we do or we you know, find interesting, literally sometimes is because, like I remember sometimes I listen to a song, and I'm like, this song is trash. But then I hear it so many times, I'm like, okay, not so bad. Literally programming. So who says you can't program your I'm not going I'm not gonna lie. Y'all know if you're if you're a level anyway, you already know. I go to the gym very often, but I do not like it. Okay? You program yourself, you may not like being in the gym, but you know that it's working, there's like there's a glory, there's a greater glory that is working in you. So yeah, okay, maybe you know, oh church, oh I'm sitting and I'm not I don't feel like I'm connecting with God. Part of it is where's your mind? Where's your heart? Right? Where is that first, like, because you got to put in that work, too. Some people are expecting to feel like wanting to pray, to feel like wanting to worship. So you want to feel, 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 feel. What are you doing? <laughs> you don't even the Holy Spirit to fall. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. He doesn't fall. You understand? So, like, you got to understand that there is the aspect of, number one, programming your mind, training yourself, but also giving way for the Holy Spirit, like, to, to do his thing and actually be open and re receptive. You know, when it's time to, to, to uh, whether it's like worship, listen, pay attention to the lyrics. You think you don't connect with God? I kid you, try singing a song to him that says, Lord God, um, what's the song? Master, you kept your word just as you said you would. Try listening to a song that says those lyrics and tell me you won't connect. Because if I'm singing a song like that in worship to God and say, Lord, you kept your word, like, I'm thinking about the words that you kept. And it moves me. Right? So part of it also, the Bible says, the Lord is not our righteous to forget our labor of love. If you choose to forget in those times of worship, it actually says something about you. That's not righteousness. It's wickedness. Right? So I could go on and on, but don't get bored in church. Program yourself. Train yourself. You can actually train yourself to enjoy certain things. You can train yourself. I'm still working on it in the gym, but... If I can go, trust me, you can do it. <laughs> I promise you. I promise you. All right, we have like, we started off with eight questions, now there's 19. So I feel like some people are asking questions here. But if you're in the room and you have a question that you want to ask live, you don't mind not being anonymous. Can I see your hand? Somebody has some questions. Can we just take the ones on the, nobody wants to not be anonymous? Linear? Okay. What is the gospel? That's not a well, anyway. <laughs> no, because when we were just talking about this is afternoon, it's always asking for someone else, but I love it. Very good. Okay. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the gospel is not something we can really like, what fully, is the Bible? <laughs> you know, exhaust in yeah. this meeting. In fact, it's taking the whole of eternity to fully understand the gospel. But I'll try to summarize as much as I can. Praise God. So the gospel is simply, you know, in the beginning God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? We all know that. Do we all believe that? Glory to God. So, and then the Bible says, God gave them everything. God gave them access to everything in the garden and told them, that there are two trees in the midst of the garden. One is not good for them. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? That the day they eat it, they will die. Glory to God. And Eve was tempted by the devil. No, 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 no. Um, oh, no, wow. no, 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 no
kind of show you the reason for Jesus. Because if you don't know why Jesus came, then you know it doesn't do you any good. Praise God. So, you know, it was tempted of the devil, and they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the problem with eating of the of the tree, it's not just the fact that they ate of the fruit, it's what it means. Knowledge of good and evil, you have to understand that before that time, everything they ever knew was what God told them. God was the one who told them, this tree is good for you, this one is bad for you. So all the knowledge that they were operating with came from God. But this tree of knowledge of good and evil promises them something, independence from God. Being able to know good and evil for themselves. So you have to understand that it wasn't just mere disobedience. It was a choice to not be under God's governance. It was a choice to be their own God. Glory to God. And they cut themselves off by eating of that tree. So that's why God said, okay, since you want to be your own God, then go fend for yourself. This God, I planted this garden, right? And it's supposed to be for someone who wants to choose or submit to me. Glory to God. So that's how the war of humanity began. When man now decides, or man is his own God, right? And we've seen what man has produced. Chaos, sickness, death, defeat, destruction, right? And the list goes on. Praise God. And that's the reason why Jesus had to come. Because he had to restore things back to how God intended for it to be. You have to know that God is perfect goodness. Sickness does not dwell in God. Evil does not dwell in God. Darkness does not dwell in God. So all that is going on in the world, God does not approve of it. And God sends his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to restore things to how they should be. And that's why the Bible says that, therefore, if any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. So you are no longer from the first Adam. You are from the second and last Adam. The first Adam was of the earth. The second Adam is the man from heaven. So now your nature, it's no longer the nature you inherited from Adam. It's the nature of righteousness that Jesus Christ has freely given to you. And that nature gives you the access and boldness to be able to stand before God without fear, without you know, guilt or inferiority. When now you can call God Father. I remember something Jesus said when he resurrected from the dead and he was talking to me. He said, go tell my brethren, that's his disciples, that I go to my God and your God. I go to my Father and your Father. Before that time, he wasn't our Father. But now through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is now our Father and he has restored us back to his own intent from the very beginning. So if you are in Christ Jesus, your life is new. Everything is perfect. Everything is glorious. You should not be sick. You should not die. Glory to God. You should not fail because there's been provision for you in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. All that Adam brought in has been um, nullified by the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That deserves Glory to God, the God. One last question. And there's so many questions here, and I really, really want to answer them. So if you're around, by the time we close properly, and um, we eat and everything like that, you still want to chat, we can literally talk after this. Um, but let me just take one last, but first of all, let me answer this one question that I saw. Says, someone said, um, is it possible that God never calls you to get married? The answer is yes. If you can find the scripture for me, <laughs> but that's very, we don't want to talk about that. The answer is yes, it is possible to not be called to be married. Um, the Bible describes people called eunuchs, right? People who are, who start lives. Matter of fact, Apostle Paul even says, it is better not to be. So the answer is yes. <laughs> All right, so this is the last question we're gonna take. And man, some of you asked some really, really good questions, so I pray you're bold enough to come directly and ask. Um, and if, so, if a group of y'all actually want us to keep talking, we'll talk after we close. But um, this last question says, it says, how do you, I'm going to mix two questions. How do you sacrifice your flesh when it comes to temptation, like to stop doing a bad habit for good? So it's not where you're doing good. So it's not where you're doing good one week and doing bad the other. And then the second question that's similar to this says, um, how do I get over certain habits? I prayed and talked to people about it, but I keep on falling. Hmm. How do you sacrifice your flesh when it comes to temptation? <laughs> 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Go ahead. Um, I 
think this is a beautiful question because I think it's something I, I've dealt with. And um, something I, I've learned recently is you have to change your desires. Because mm -hmm. if you continue to desire, if you continue to desire the things of this world, the things that you are trying to get away from, and you don't generally want to get better from it, or you don't generally want to find a solution in your heart, because it's a thing of, oh, God, I'm struggling with this. I, I, I want to get better from this. But if you don't believe in your heart, you want to get better, you will never get better. Mm -hmm. It will just be an endless loop of motivation into depression, motivation into depression, and you're just going to keep finding yourself in this cycle. And what, what has happened for me in the, in the past few weeks I've, 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 I've saw myself changing my desire. Like, now it's like, I'm excited. I'm excited every day to give up. I don't want to go out no more. I want to worship with God. You feel me? I want to worship with God. I, I'm yearning for them moments. If you yearn for them things, at the end of the day, the other things don't matter. You start to see yourself changing. You start to see yourself thinking different, acting different. You start to see... Yourself from a few weeks ago is not the same the same person you are now. So yeah. Um, I think to in order to change, there's a few things you have to do. Um, I also dealt with some things in the past, my brother you said as well. First things first, I would say go on a word like a word therapy, right? Mm -hmm. So the word of God daily, every single day. Imagine doing, let's say you have a smoking addiction, right? And you smoke for 10 years, and you think one week of the word will just fix that whole, that's, it doesn't work like that. You have to literally stay in the word till your desires change, right? Mm -hmm. Not only that, but you have to stay in the place of prayer consistently as well, right? Because the Bible talks about how we wrestle not against flesh and blood, mm -hmm. right? We literally, there's literally powers, rulers of darkness, right? Um, trying to deceive people and make people follow through deception, right? Um, so sometimes it may, it can also be um, some type of spirit or whatever the case may be. I'm not gonna get into that, right? But you need to pray every single day. You need to be in the word every single day. Then do that, your desires will begin to change because the Lord will begin to help you, right? And then, yeah, but you also have your part to play. God is gonna play his part every single time, I promise you. But once you play your part as well too, everything will work out. Yeah. Love it, love it. All right, real quick. So I'm actually adding on to what Joba said because um, with this, it really has to do with intentionality. What are you, if you're actually intentional about having your desire change, mm -hmm. like like we, like Avi said, you actually want to be better, want to drop these habits. You like it, it, it's it's important what you're allowing yourself to be around, what you're continuing, what are you continuing to listen to, what are you continuing to watch, because. Right. A lot of these things, life is very spiritual, and a lot of people think, oh, it's just that. But you don't realize you're actually opening gates up, you're opening spiritual gates by keeping yourself surrounded by what you don't, you have no business being surrounded by. So, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. Something, something important that I asked, I asked somebody. I said, and you can ask yourself this question as well, too. Whatever, um, whatever you're dealing with, right, let's say smoking, drinking, uh, addiction to whatever the case may be, is it that is it that you're trying to cut it off temporarily, right? Because emotions can make you feel like, you know what I'm saying, well, this thing is getting to me right now. Is it that you're trying to cut it off for right now and then go back to it, or you're trying to cut it off forever? You have to think about that. If you already have a mindset that, I'm gonna lie, I'm gonna go back to it. That's facts though, you have to ask yourself those questions. So it's like it's like wiring, right? Imagine so the way you the way you are right now is based off of how you've been taught for the past years, right? So now you have to literally change those wires with the word of God. You have to think differently. You know what I'm saying? I think it's important to be so bad. Oh yes, I'll
struggling with that addiction. And that's the truth. You are not. The Bible says in 1 John 4 verse 17, Pastor Rachel read that scripture, says, as he is, so are you in this world. Does Jesus have addiction to drinking? Does he have addiction to smoking? I mean, that scripture is very literal, as he is. It's a, if you're a mathematic student, right, there is this thing called direct proportion. X equals to Y. If X equals to two, Y equals to two, right? So the Bible is saying that as Jesus is, so look at all the features that are in Christ. Those are all the features that are in, that are in you. So you're not struggling. So establish that in your mind. So go from that standpoint, right? So when you see yourself, even when you feel like you have that urge or that desire, you tell yourself, no, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That as Jesus is, so am I in this world, or so I am in this world. I am not struggling with this addiction. You have to declare who you are. And it's the understanding of who you are that will help you trump that challenge. Do you understand? So identity is very, establish that in your mind and you'll be good. And even if you were sober, like you were saying, you were sober for two, for two years and then you broke sober already once. You're still not a drunkard. Right. Like, uh, you're still not that Just person. because you had a bad moment. Yes. So don't let it define you. That's not you. No, 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 not you. <laughs> no, that's that's very important. Thank you for for the different questions and perspectives. Um, you know, I'll just add just one last thing. I think it's kind of what in line with what Josh was saying. You know, the Bible says to guard your heart. It says with all diligence and looking for all right? right? It's Mount Run. Guard. It's literally, it's, no, literally. It says for out of it flows all the issues of life. You gotta understand that, like when we talk about guarding, uh, I'm not gonna lie. The, uh, the, <laughs> people say I keep falling into habits. I keep falling. Did you fall, or did you kind of like? Did you walk? Did you like, uh, walk right into it and accidentally? You know. So it's kind of also understanding. Number one, you're like you said, your environment. Like, I tell people all the time, the certain shows I will not watch. I do not care how good it is. People were raving about Game of Thrones till today. Oh, y'all get those days? <laughs> you were raving. That first episode, I saw it, and I was like, ain't no way. <laughs> Same thing with, like, for me and power. People love power. Now I know. Mm-hmm. I see the smile, so I know y'all know season. How many seasons they have now? You see? You see? You see? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But that's for, that's for me. I couldn't do it because I'm like, there's no way I'm going to watch this. And like my mind would not be, you know what I mean? Like, so even certain songs you listen to, there's certain songs that have to turn on because I'm like, bro, why am I feeling like crying? I tell, I tell my sister all the time, this artist she really loves, I call it suicide music, because I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. But every time I listen to it, I kid you not, it's like a spirit. I'm not even joking, music is spiritual. Every time, every time I hear her playing it, I'm like, this is so, it's like dragging my, I'm just, so certain times you're thinking about habits, who are you around? What kind of things do you watch? What kind of things are you normalizing? What do you read? What do you listen to? Clear your feed. Clear your feed, bro. Follow, block, delete. Delete. <laughs> and and it's, it's real. It's real. So I just wanted to add that aspect as well because we talked about identity. We talked about um, renewing your mind. We talked about word therapy. But 
It's also the practical aspect of like, who are you, what are you doing exactly? And friends are easy. They really are. The Bible talks about, even when it talks about like um, sexual morality, I was just flee. So don't even like, don't even like, you know sometimes people be like, oh, I keep falling, but why was you sleeping over in the first place? No, like, let's be honest. You think you're going to lay next to someone you love, and oh, we're just going to be so... <laughs> don't, literally, Joseph, take, take the jacket. Take the, I'm gone. Run, bro. Why are you, why are you, oh, we're doing vacation. You know that that's the, you know the water's, the water's just yeah. sounding, the breeze is blowing. It's a, <laughs> so and do we, no, literally, like, every, all the conditions are right. What do you mean you fell? You didn't fall. You ran into, <laughs> you ran out. <laughs> you choked. <laughs> so, yeah, let's just be so for real. Um. So praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Like I said, if you more questions, but if you have a specific point that wasn't answered, please, you can talk to any one of us. Or, you know, we can keep the conversation going afterwards. But please, 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 you know, this is important. Some of these questions that we're asking, like, number one, never feel like a question is too stupid or a question is, oh, why? Literally, it's important to ask the right questions. And not only ask, I want to I harp on this part because... Yes, you ask questions. Yes, receive answers. What are you gonna do with it? What are you gonna do with it? Is it just gonna be like, oh, we went to this? Oh, okay, it was nice, and then you go back. But like, when you receive answers from God, there's freedom of choice. There's free will. What are you gonna do with it? What are you gonna do with it? Are you actually gonna take the answers to these questions and the things that we discuss and make full proof of it and actually apply it to your life? But it's important to recognize that none of these things we've discussed can be applied without the Holy Spirit. No matter how hard you try, I tell people all the time, sometimes I'm talking to someone I'm ministering the gospel, and they're like, oh, I'm just trying to get myself together. You know, when I stop praying, I'll come to God. When I stop smoking and drinking, I'll come to God. When I stop having sex, I'll come to God. When I stop, I'm just like, you're, you're working backwards. So backwards. Because it's first through him that you even have the ability. Literally. How? When we talk about desires, you want to do what? Literally. <laughs> oh, it's speaking of someone asked a question like how do I feel content? There's no content that I'm asking. So you're working backwards. And so even now as we wrap up, you know, I'm gonna just we're gonna say a quick prayer. But you've got to understand that first and foremost, none of these answers apply to you if you're not saved. Truly, not because you got baptized when you were six. But none of this matters, none of this counts. If you haven't given your heart to Christ, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's important to realize that it's his spirit that does the work. Um, Brother Rivera was talking about how some people have little actual like wiring in their brains that causes certain things. Did you know that it is only the name of Jesus? Yes, they've invented some drugs, but those those pills are temporary. They'll make you feel nice, but I'm not gonna lie. That's all I'm about to say. Some of the side effects were Jesus Christ. 
And number two, if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, group, if you've never been one again, like I said, this is not something where you say, well, I'll do it later, or I'll try and get myself together. That's not, that's not how this works. That's not how this works. So wherever you are, if that's you, and you've never taken that step, I always tell people, what do you have to lose? Because when Jesus comes into your heart, he literally transforms everything. Everything. So if you'd like to say this prayer with me right now, I just want to see your hand really quickly. We're going to pray together. I'll just say it after me, say, oh Lord God, I believe with all my heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that he died for me. And he was resurrected from the dead. For my justification. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life from this day forward. I thank you, Lord. I have eternal life. Thank you for saving my soul. I'm now a child of God. I'm now born again. Glory to God. And if you said that prayer, that would we never be the same again. Glory to God. Amen. And like I said, there was a second call that I made. You know, for those, maybe you've already been saved, you've already been born again, but you want to see the manifestation of God's presence and power, not even in His presence, but God's power in your life more than ever before. It's important that you're filled with the Spirit. The Bible talks about in the book of Acts how Paul came to a bunch of believers, and he asked them, have you yet, you know, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost? And he said, no, we won't be baptized in water. We only know about John's baptism. The Bible records that he went ahead and got them filled with the Holy Spirit. And from then on, the Bible says, mightily grew the word. It spread abroad. You want to take your Christian life to a new level. I'm going to have you, wherever you are, I'm just going to say this prayer for me. Same thing, all eyes closed and all heads down. I'm going to say, oh Lord God, I thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. I declare right now that I received your spirit into my life. Thank you, Lord, for your divine enablement. Thank you for your spirit. I confess with my mouth now and declare that I'm full of your Holy Spirit. From this day forward. In Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. And if you said that prayer, I want to pray with you especially after. So please come find me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. We've been blessed. Yes. Praise God. Where is Jasmine? Give a round of applause. So, first of all, thank you so much for our team. Can we have a round of applause? Summer Power Hour Series. Woo! And if you 
find the link again, contact one of the girls, please.